Welcome to Growing Tech with Greg Williamson and Owen Scott. Today we're with Dan Tyre from HubSpot, the Michael Jordan of tech selling. Experienced sales director, president, CEO and executive. Today we're going to cover how Dan got into tech and then some of the key challenges for selling tech companies. Great, so uh, good morning our time, Dan. Greg, Owen, that was a big build up. I like that. Did you make that up? The Michael <laughs> Jordan of tech? Yeah, all right, I'm gonna use that. I'm gonna say my friend Owen talks about me as the Michael Jordan of HubSpot. Yeah, Beautiful. You, can, you can use that, you can use that. Okay. Done. <laughs> but we'll start at the, so you're you're at the, at the top of your game now, but if we go back, um, you actually start, I think your first selling job was selling books door to door, was it? How, what did you learn from that? Yeah. Okay. So that was amazing. I, I know I sound like your grandfather, right? But selling books door to door in, in 1972 and 1973, right? I grew up um, solidly middle class, but I uh, didn't have a lot of money to go to university. So uh, I did all these odd jobs while I was at uh, college. I was a football referee. I was on the radio. I worked in the dining hall, uh, but I still didn't have enough uh, money to go back the next year. So there was this company called the Southwestern Company which had this business model. They would recruit uh, at uh, Northeast colleges. They uh, would um, kind of suggest that you go down to Nashville, Tennessee, in the south of the United States, drive down in the back of the station wagon. They teach you how to sell for uh, a week. Then they'd send you all the way across the country. In my case, the first year in uh, uh, Bellingham in Seattle, Washington, the second year in Portland, Oregon. And they sent you across the country because 80% of the people washed out, right? They They... It, like selling books door to door was hard. I was selling two dictionaries for $40, $40. It's way before the internet, right? And these dictionaries uh, had um, special sections for like new math and English and all the stuff encyclopedias had. And um, it was a, a pretty amazing, right? And selling dictionaries door to door, um, you learn a lot about, first of all, sales. Second of all, you learn a lot about um doing things that are hard, right? Because 80% of the people left, they left alone. You're like, mm -hmm. okay, I better sell something or I'm not going to eat, right? And you get an opportunity to engage with all kinds of different socioeconomic classes, rich people, poor people, people who are scuffling, people who are on easy street, people who are hardcore, people who are lazy. And it was amazing, right? When you meet that many people at a relatively young age, I was probably 17 or 18, right? Uh, first of all, it redeems your faith in humanity. These people were so nice to me. Oh my goodness. I'm knocking on their door. I'm ringing their doorbell. They're like, who are you? I'm like, I'm Dan. I'm the book salesman. You don't shoot them around here, do you? And they would be like, sometimes, right? I still remember my pitch. This is like 40 years ago, right? And then I would uh, explain to them what they were. And then I'd have to get them to give me money up front, right? Which they did. And the first year I made 5,000 US. Second year I recruited some guys, made 10,000 uh, US. Uh, but the most important thing that I learned is uh, how to hustle, right? Because it's hard work, right? You would talk to 60 people a day, right? If they weren't home, you'd cycle back at the end and you'd have to move quick, right? Uh, but I learned the basics of the sales process about how to engage with people, how to be friendly, right? How to use emotional tie downs, how to answer objections. And it served me uh, as a very good entrance into um, my uh, 45 year sales career. So, Dan, with that sort of background, you know, knocking on doors, and then my understanding is you started selling, you know, PCs at a store in Boston. How did, you know, why do you think you've done so well in, in selling technology? All right. So, uh, a couple of things. First of all, when I graduated in university, I was a bass player in a heavy metal rock and roll band. I had longer hair than your producer who was in the shot just before that. It was like uh, one of those things where um, it was a great job, but it didn't pay a lot, right? And uh, after a year on the road, I'm like, okay, I need to like start to establish my career. So uh, back in 1982, right, when you wanted to buy a personal computer, you went into a computer store. You guys are too young to remember that. <laughs> right? No, we do. We do. Anyway, I went to a place called the computer store because it sounded pretty good to me. It was the worst run company in the history of America. These guys were horrible, right? They had terrible management. They had constant turnover. They had inventory problems. 
they weren't particularly ethical or moral. It was crazy. Uh, but I was there and they offered me a job. I sold Apple II E's, right, for uh, this place called the Computer Store. They had an exclusive to sell Apple Computer east of the Mississippi, like the center, half of the United States, and they found a way to screw that up. Anyway, I was, uh, I was good because um, I understood the business value of a computer. These accountants would come in, and there was this old program called VisiCalc. You guys remember VisiCalc? Yeah. Lotus one, two, three. It was just a spreadsheet, right? Now yeah. you got Google Docs and everybody uses them. But like people would cry when they'd see how you could <laughs> adjust one cell and the whole calculation would instantly fall in place. It was uh, very rudimentary by today's standards, but um, the business value was amazing. And in the early days of PCs, the way you sold them was you said, we have PCs in inventory. And people would come in and give you $18,000 US because you had them. Because one of the greatest uh, like attributes of being a good salesperson is you should always sell something people want to buy, right? And in 1982, everybody was buying computers because it was brand new. Anyway, um, my boss comes in after about a year and he says, I'm quitting. I'm like, why? He's like, I'm going to a startup. I'm like, what's a startup? He goes, it's a small company that's going to grow quickly. I'm like, okay, knock yourself out. He's like, no, 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 I want to bring you with me. I'm like, I already got a job. He goes, I'll pay $100 more US a month. I'm like, yeah, I'm a startup guy. So I left with Roger, right? And, and it changed my entire life. It changed my entire life. I moved to this company called Businessland, which was $2 million when I joined. Over the next nine years, they grew to $1.4 billion, right? It was explosive growth. It was growing thousands of per, per year. And I moved from a salesperson to a manager to a area director to executive. And I really liked the hyper growth. The reason I was good at it, right, is because uh, I always went the extra mile. Uh, what my book selling days taught me is how to work hard. No one works harder than me. Even today, right? I get in the office at seven o'clock in the morning, right? People look at me like, what are you doing there, old man? I'm like, I'm working. And they're like, why are you here at seven? The office really doesn't open anymore. But like most people get in it, like, I don't know, between eight and nine. I'm like, because I want to get a head start on everybody. And I, number one, outworked everybody. Number two, I knew how to hustle. Number three, I was like helping. Right. So if people had a problem, even if they weren't my customer, I'd be like, yeah, let me see if I can help. And um, the industry, as I mentioned, was um, exploding and people needed just a little bit of extra care and help. So uh, part of it was my environment. Part of it is I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Part of it was my applying the classic sales process to um, selling computers. And uh, part of it was being in the right place at the right time. Cool. That's awesome. I mean, I think um, you were employee number six at HubSpot, first sales manager, started the partner program, which we're part of, obviously, and, and, and really uh, value. Can you sort of believe how successful HubSpot's been and, and what would you, what's your biggest sort of insight from, the, from your years at HubSpot? Amazing. So as I mentioned, I started as an entrepreneur in 1982. I've done five startups, but HubSpot is by far my most successful. My first one went to a billion and a half dollars right, in the 80s and the early 90s. Then I quit and I started my own company, um, ALI Technologies in Needham, Massachusetts, and I grew it to about $30 million, mm -hmm. sold it to a Phoenix-based company. That's how I got to Arizona, which is where I am now in the United States, Southwestern United States. My third company went bankrupt, which taught me business planning and humility, right? I'm a hard-charging <laughs> entrepreneur, right? And now all of a sudden, I'm, my company's going into receivership. And that was hard for me to understand, but it taught me a very, very valuable lesson. My fourth startup got bought up by Microsoft. Lucky me, right? And then my fifth startup, at my fourth startup, my boss was this guy, Brian Halleck. And uh, when Microsoft bought Groove Networks, he went to uh, MIT, met Dharmesh. I went to um, the uh, work for Microsoft for six months and then president of a software company. And when they uh, started scaling, Brian called me. They're like, we need you to start this new company. I'm like, why do you need me? You're in Boston. I'm in Arizona. He's like, you're a good startup guy. I'm like, that's true. He's like, you're a good sales guy. I'm like, that's true too. And we need to. So I joined and it was amazing because everything I learned before 2007 went right out the window. I was not the vice president of sales. In fact, and I, I didn't start the partner program. That was my buddy, Pete Caputa. But I was an early employee. I get so much credit for starting HubSpot, partly because I always... I'm always branded, but partly yeah. because I've been around for 15 years, right? We're just celebrating our inbound program, right? Uh, 10,000 people will be in Boston in the early part of uh, September. Barack Obama is going to speak. Um, all kinds of uh, great um, speakers, uh, Jane Goodall, the gorilla lady. 
anyway, everybody thinks just because I've been there for so long, uh, I, I, what's my idea? I wasn't on the, at the very early stage for the first seven years, I was a uh, executive, ran divisions and um, did every job at HubSpot. Uh, but then the real entrepreneur, like the real business people took over, right? And I just liked the mission so much. Everything that we did uh, before 2007 was obsolete, right? The way we grew companies, the way we focus. In fact, I worked for this guy, Mark Roberge. You guys ever heard that name, Mark? Yep. Yep. He wrote a, yep. he wrote a book that you should uh, your podcast listeners should get called the Sales Acceleration Formula. He's the entrepreneur in residence at Harvard Business School. He's the uh, general partner at uh, Stage Two Capital, where I'm a limited partner. And he's just uh, in seven years we had one argument, right? He's the nicest guy. He's super smart. He's strategic. He set the um, the direction. He set the strategy. And all I had to do is uh, implement. And he was super smart. He looked at all the numbers. The reason he was so effective, we went from zero to 100 million in seven years, right? Which in those days, no one ever did. That was like one of the fastest growing companies. Now it's a little bit different because we pivoted again, right? But uh, I learned so much about how to look at sales as a technology, how to look at sales from an empathetic perspective. And I remember uh, very early, in the uh, in, in um, like figuring out sales strategy, we think, okay, what would Oracle do? We're going to do the exact opposite. Whatever like a major tech company would do, we're going to do the complete opposite. Good strategy, yeah. and, and it turned out great. We went and we <laughs> very very quickly. All of our selling was on the phone, right? We rarely went out belly to belly with a customer. We didn't do trade shows, and we leveraged the inbound revolution of people coming to the website. I invented this term called schmarketing. You guys ever heard of schmarketing? Say it with a New Zealand accent, schmarketing. 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 Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I invented that term. Ah, oh, right. Yeah. Uh, I know, in 2007. Uh, this guy, um, Thomas Steenberg, he was a professor at Harvard <laughs> Business School. And he's like, um, he was interviewing us for um, some paper he's doing. And um, I said, it's in 2007, it's not sales, it's mar not marketing, it's, it's <laughs> schmarketing. It's pushed together. Because... Right in the old days, uh, sales was always the hero. They did everything. They did ninety percent yeah. of the work. They got a hundred percent of the glory. Right, and marketing was always in the doghouse. Right, marketing would create the brand and do lead generation. Sales would take the leads, qualify the leads, do the product demo, answer the objection, close the deals, and they got all the budget. They got all the glory. And in fact, if marketing did a bad job, I would blame them. They were my built-in excuse. I would say, ah. I don't have enough leads. It's marketing's fault. They get thrown under the bus. Or I got too many leads. I don't know what to call. It's marketing fault. And that process ended with the beginning of the inbound revolution, where you trick out your website, right? Where you generate inbound leads, where the salespeople take people who've already raised their hand and shown that there's an interest in uh, engagement. And then you pick up the phone. And it's a much different process now in uh, 2022 than it was back then. Right, inbound has gone through this huge change over the last 15 years, where it used to be inbound marketing. Now it's inbound marketing, inbound sales, inbound service, inbound operations, mm -hmm. and HubSpot and the whole inbound revolution is all about um, the uh, front office execution of technology uh, to grow for a competitive advantage. So what do you see are the biggest mistakes that tech companies make when it comes to selling? You know, in this particular, I suppose, in this, this new inbound world that you've been talking about. All right, you put that on the briefing sheet, and uh, that is a very good question, right, that I rarely get uh, asked, right? Um, but it's an important question, right, because um, it's just different now, right? And um, there's a couple of, uh, like, foundations to the inbound revolution, right? Um, the first is, uh, have you ever heard of an author by the name of Daniel Pink? Yes, yep. Yeah, he wrote a book called uh, To Sell as Human. And what he said is that every minute of every day, you're either buying or selling. The people who listen to this podcast are either buying what I'm saying or they're like rolling their eyes going, oh my goodness, another crazy American, right? And so you have to be aware of that. It's a, a basic human kind of thing that everybody does, right? Um, so understanding that um, that exists is like an, an important component of ensuring that... Um, Everybody understands the right approach, right, to helping. And the inbound process is uh, ensuring that you are um, doing the right thing for everybody, right? We help first before we um, sell, 
right? The basis of the inbound philosophy, I wrote a book in 2018 called The um, Inbound Organization, right? And the inbound organization is all about, number one, treating people like human beings, which seems like... Uh, it seems like you shouldn't have to remind people about that in 2022, <laughs> but just like look at my Twitter feed and you'll recognize that you have to remind people about that. Number two, right? You help first, regardless of economic self-interest. Number three, focus beats bandwidth. So lots of times people are just general. So they'll say, I'll sell to everybody. But in 2022, mm -hmm. the riches are in the niches or in New Zealand. If you want to go to the beaches, you've got to work the niches. <laughs> and so the idea is that you're uh, 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 an expert in a specific area, right? Number four, you got to solve for the customer. If you're not solving for the customer, and that is hard in any attribute, right? As you're scaling and up spot partners, you're going to understand that there are some difficulties and challenges, right, with uh, some of your early customers. But you, you got to do the best you can to solve for that customer. And then uh, customer experience is your only competitive advantage. So uh, in today's world, Product development goes so quickly that we used to make decisions based on um, product features that competitors wouldn't have for a long time. And today, virtually all products are fundamentally the same. And if they're not, they will be in a short period of time. So understanding the uh, journey that each persona takes, intentionally designing an experience to make sure that you're meeting the customer where they are. Right. Building in win win relationships with everybody in the ecosystem like HubSpot. Um, work so hard to do with our um, partners. Uh, and then finally, measuring everything and leveraging technology to create uh, personalized value. In the old days, you could say, oh, I'm a nonprofit. We're not really technical, right? Or we're just a startup. We haven't leaned in. You can't do that anymore, right? Uh, yeah. Driven by our B2C experience, right? You expect everything personalized, right? Immediately delivered to you, just like you have on your iPhone, right? Or on your Android phone. Right. And so that permeates through all of business. And it's a um, it's a 30 year um, migration that we're probably, I don't know, 40, maybe 30, 40 percent through. Right. But if you cycle in and somebody know, doesn't know who you are, if you've dropped your contact information and they haven't reviewed you on LinkedIn, if you don't have lead intelligence or lead notification, uh, if you don't have uh, uh, instant access to your CRM, whether you're on the road or whatever. Right. Then you're in a huge uh, competitive disadvantage. Right. And so um, technology now provides that competitive advantage and inbound um, is uh, one of the premium ways to uh, deliver. Brilliant. That's uh, that's great insights. Thank you, Dan. Um, I, suppose, I mean, it's, and it's really resonant that riches in the niches uh, concept. I mean, that's certainly the way we've approached it. You know, we're at the bottom of the world here, but we've focused on technology companies as our customers and um you know managed to get to elite that way you know coming from a, from a small little town at the bottom of the world so you know it does work so first of all you'll scale more quickly if you're the go-to yeah. uh, hubspot partner for technology companies in new zealand right there's got to be i don't know thousand at least a thousand maybe a couple hundred right that they want to know that you specialize in technology, either software yeah. or hardware. Yeah. They want to know that you know the vocabulary and the seasonality and the sequence and the pace and all that kind of stuff. Well, I, t I tell you, Dan, actually, we ha we managed to get a, a contract with a Silicon Valley company last year because they were looking in the HubSpot directory for a tech specialist. So that's, that's not too bad, eh? That's selling ice to the Eskimos. <laughs> all right. Oh, and we didn't practice that, right? That was in the briefing sheet, just off the top of your head, because you guys are focused. And if I was um, looking for a partner in New Zealand, that's exactly what I would do. I'd go to the uh, HubSpot Solutions Partner Directory. I'd find New Zealand. I'd look at the reviews. I'd find the people who say, no, we work with tech companies or global tech companies worldwide, right? Yeah. And then I'd engage. And if you say, oh, no, 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 we work with global tech companies that are moving into New Zealand that want to accelerate their understanding of the local market, does that sound like you? People would be like, that sounds exactly like me. You're getting that business, right? If somebody cycles in and say, yeah, we're HubSpot customer, you may get that business, but it's a lot harder. So it's one of the hardest things that um, entrepreneurs do. And you asked a good question, Owen. You're like, well, what's the hardest thing to do? That niching, you'll actually grow more quickly in 2022. It's not always the case because in the old days, like 2014, you could be a generalist. But in uh, 2022, right, if you're focused, on a very specific niche, and you get good word of mouth, HubSpot calls that the flywheel, right? Yeah. Flywheel is the way in which you generate a word of mouth buzz by putting your customers at the center of the um, sales process, right? And um, the flywheel 
uh, helps you build community. And in 2022, right, you're as strong as your community. The ability for you to generate, right, uh, that good word of mouth is as important to your company as your sales organization. Because when the salesperson, first of all, in the sales process, 80% of it is done with the marketing anyway. By the time one of our salespeople picks up the phone, it's still hard. There's still a lot of stuff to do, but somebody's been to the website multiple times. They've seen the pricing page. They understand a little bit about the HubSpot culture code. They understand a little bit about what the business is all about and how we may be able to help them. And all the studies say that people prefer self-service. They want to go as long as they can in the sales process without talking to a salesperson. Once they've done that, they want the salesperson to understand what their journey is previously, all the things that they've looked at, answer a few questions, give them a good discount and get an easy on-ramp to get started, right? And unless you have one central repository of information, both sales and marketing are looking at right? That becomes a little bit more uh, difficult. But if it's all in one place and everybody can look at it and I can say, wait a second, Owen, you came to the HubSpot website in 2013 and then you didn't do anything for two years. And then you came back with Greg in uh, 2015 and you downloaded these three uh, eBooks about uh, becoming a partner, right? Now all of a sudden you're like, okay, this guy Tyre is on the ball, right? Yeah. Uh, rather than saying, and it really helps build that um, trust or relationship that's critically important. Well, we've just just about out of time, Dan. So, I mean, I suppose we'll we'll finish. Do you have any final piece of advice for uh, tech companies down under? We work with tech companies across Australia and New Zealand, uh, wanting to, you know, grow globally, particularly in the US. Yeah, awesome. Uh, number one, always find your why. If you go to dantire.com, you'll see I have a blog article called uh, Scaling a Successful Company in 2022. The first question I always ask is, why are you doing this? Because as you guys know, how long have you been uh, running your agency? 18 years. Okay. There are a few twists and turns in 18 years, haven't you? Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there have been times you're like, oh, my God, what did I do? And times you're like the master of the universe. But if you've got a strong why and a good partner, Right. We always we like to see uh, companies that uh, are emotionally supported, companies that have uh, two co-founders are typically uh, more successful than solo entrepreneur. Um, that goes a long way towards helping you get through the tough times. Number two, I tell people always have a plan, a written plan. My third company went bankrupt. It was because I didn't have a written plan. If I had a written plan. Right. I still would have lost 95 percent of my <laughs> revenue, but I would have known how to pivot and I would have anticipated that. And I'd have the contingency. Number three, build your competitive advantage in a niche. Find your niche. If you don't have a, a niche, get one, right? Because the nichier you can be, the more successful you will, will be. Build a great culture, right? Uh, in the book I wrote, Inbound Organization, we asked um, Brian Halligan and uh, Frank Osher and Allison Savory and Katie Bird, what's more important? Is it your happy employees or happy customers? What do you think they said? Happy employees. Why? You're right, by the way, Greg. Because <laughs> they deliver the experience, I suppose, to the customer, don't they? If, if you have, uh, if you don't have happy employees, it's hard to get happy customers. Exactly right. And so you focus on the culture. HubSpot has the culture code, just Google culture yeah. code or ask Greg and Owen. They'll give it to you. We get, uh, go through a lot of uh, process to make sure we get people who uh, ascribe to the culture code, use good judgment, right? And then uh, we support them. Uh, that employee happiness is critically important. And then number five, you create a great customer experience. That's no easy task. Everybody's different. But if you're in a specific niche, right? It becomes a little easier. After you create the experience, you create a world-class community. And uh, the virtual part of uh, Inbound this year, 2021, um, we'll talk a little bit about mm -hmm. the stepping stones using technology to create community because uh, building a community of your folks are super important. And then uh, if you need help along the way, just don't forget to raise your hand. Right. HubSpot uh, gives away a ton of free stuff. You can get it through Greg and Owen. They have all of the contacts. And um, our tagline is we want uh, millions of businesses, individuals, leaders, companies, uh, divisions to grow better. And the reason uh, I'm honored to be on your podcast is uh, happy to be part of that and will help you or um, any of your customers to the best of my ability. So that brings us to the end of uh, a very enjoyable interview with Dan Tyre from HubSpot. Um, Owen, what did you uh, make of that? What, what was sort of an insight you pulled out of it? Well, it's pretty cool listening to Dan talk, actually. I really enjoyed that. Um, I think there was a whole lot of really cool messages in there, but one of the picked up to me was this sort of changing role of marketing and sales. How, you know, sales used to be 
they were in control of the situation, they were the boss and it was all about them, about pushing, pushing, pushing and closing deals, selling. And now it's much more of a, I suppose, a balanced with marketing and sales mm. and also the consumer, you know, with the inbound concept mm. you talked about with them, you know, trying to be helpful and giving them yeah. giving them material. I think that's just, the way that's whole changed, you, you need to be aware of that in your business and make sure that you're working that way. Yeah, yeah and I agree. I mean, having that customer at the centre of everything, the customer experience is really yeah. cool. But also, I think a bit of that, um, you know, he talked about the old school of, you know, he did learn the hard way around yeah. how to sell, how to meet objections, how to deal with, you know, and he's used that nice combo of a real inbound philosophy with those fantastic skills and energy as a salesperson. Yeah. It was also really good to, for, you know, to hear him reinforce the, the niche. You yeah. know, it's been a real philosophy of concentrate about focus, and he's basically saying if you're a tech company wanting to go to the States, it's all about the niche, really, really focused down. So that was awesome. Yeah. So some great um, insights there for tech companies. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we certainly did. Uh, and we'll be back with another great um, guest with some expertise in growing your tech company uh, very soon. Thanks for uh, watching and listening. Thanks.